I'm very happy to uh, introduce our, our speaker. Uh, Randall Kennard has uh, actually spoken on a number of occasions in our College of Science and Engineering, uh, dating back two years, three years, two years, two years, on a number of different topics, all of which are, I think, related uh, uh, very closely or peripherally to uh, value creation. And value creation in this context, I mean uh, engineering uh, products, engineering solutions, and uh, in various aspects. T today's uh, focus is on intellectual property, uh, patents. Uh, this is a, an area that I think has interested our students in the past, primarily those who have seen entrepreneurial activities or new product creation uh, here in Armenia and, and looking at global markets as a, a hopeful uh, direction or a current direction. I know some of you are involved in such activity. Even if you're not, I think it's, it's uh, great to hear firsthand uh, from someone with many years of experience in actually many different uh, high-tech and engineering uh, sectors and leading companies and, and someone who has directly undergone this process of patent application successfully uh, in the U.S. and is currently involved in, uh, in projects here in Armenia. Um, I don't have the, our flyer in front of me to, to list uh, his background, uh, but maybe he can take a minute and, and introduce some of those highlights himself on where Mr. Pinar has worked and what kind of uh, experience he's drawing upon because I think it's very relevant and very interesting. So without uh, further uh, introduction, uh, welcome all of you to our College of Science and Engineering seminar and Mr. Pinar. Okay, my name is Randall Pinar and I'm an American Armenian living in Los Angeles, second generation of Armenian. So my Armenian isn't too good. Uh, I spent 20 years at Raytheon, which is uh, one of the top aerospace companies in the United States, for military and industrial uh, aerospace. And so that's primarily where most of my experience is, although I have worked at other companies in the medical and commercial uh, engineering areas. So what I wanted to do today was talk to you about intellectual property and patents, compare it a little bit with uh, what's happening in Armenia, but primarily I'm going to talk about how it's done in the United States. And the reason I'm talking about primarily the United States is because that's where the money is. If you want to make, uh, if you have an invention and you want to make money, unfortunately you're not going to make a lot of money in Armenia because the market's small here. So if you want to make money, you're going to have to go to the United States and get a patent there. So we're going to concentrate on that and we'll talk a little bit about uh, of Europe and Russia and Armenia in terms of the patents. Okay, the definition of intellectual property. You can see so what comes out of your brain, what's out of your mind, what invention do you have, what have you thought of that's different, something that's tangible, something that can be uh, used for a, a valuable product. There's different types of intellectual property, as you see here technical data and software also, but we're primarily going to talk about hardware, although there's not that much difference when you're talking about software. There are some differences. Mm -hmm. Companies' intellectual property is what's most important for your competitive advantage, not the technology. It's the intellectual property itself. We're going to talk about that more. <coughs> All right, kind of here is what we're going to go through real quick. So I'm not going to go over it. Just take a quick look. Um, we'll step through each one of these areas. Right. Here's something that was taken out of The Economist in 2006. There's two ways to grow, through mergers and acquisitions or through innovation. So we're going to talk about innovation. Mergers and acquisitions, that's for the lawyers. That doesn't bring value. That doesn't create new jobs. We're talking about innovation, technology, and creating new jobs. 
And here's another quote for uh, with regard to British companies falling behind. So there's a concern in England. Okay, why do you want to protect intellectual property? You want to protect your innovation, and if you can't protect it, why are you investing in it? If you're investing your time and your money into coming up with a with a new invention, if you're not going to protect it, why are you doing it? Somebody will steal it. I guarantee you, the Chinese will, because they don't value intellectual property in that country. It's a, it's a major problem worldwide. So you got piracy, counterfeiting, unfair competition. Patent convey, conveys the right to exclude others. Now what that means is when you get a patent, that, that there's no guarantee that anybody, no one will steal it. You get a patent, somebody's going to want to steal it anyway. The only thing that the patent does is allows you to sue them and try to recover from them whatever money you can get out of them. That's it. There's no other protection. It just allows you to take them to court and sue them. So you have to get your patents in various countries. You just can't get it in one country. If you get a patent in Armenia and somebody steals your idea for China or in the U.S. or in Germany, if your patent doesn't cover those countries, you can't sue them. You can only sue them where you have your patent coverage. Alright, I just covered that here. It excludes others from making them all. When I say excludes, it excludes it because you're allowed to sue them. Now, the reason you want to get a patent, you want to prevent other companies from using your technology because hopefully your technology is superior. You want to prevent them from using it. So they're at a disadvantage. You have an advantage, they're at a disadvantage because they can't copy you. At least they can't copy you legally. Now, patent documents are available to the public 18 months. Now, this is, this is generally, so this is something after filing of the patent application. That number changes. I wouldn't worry about that too much. Now, it's important that when you're filing for a patent, or before you file, you have to figure out, okay, which country should I get a patent in? Now, you're here in Armenia. You have a brilliant idea. You probably want to get a patent in Armenia to start with. But then you better figure out what other countries that your idea is going to be valuable in. You probably want to get a patent in the United States. You probably want to get a European Union patent. European Union patent covers 33 countries in the European Union. So virtually all the countries in Western Europe and some of the countries in Eastern Europe, including some of the ex-Soviet Republics, uh, Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, I, I, two or three of them, either two or all three are in the European Union now. So there's 33 countries. So you may want to get a European Union patent, you may want to get a U.S. patent, you get an Armenian patent. And it's not cheap, and we're, we'll talk about that later. Your patent rights may be lost if not pursued in a timely fashion, and I'm going to go over this in more detail later, and that should answer some of your questions. Okay, now, if you have an idea and you're thinking, oh, I want to patent this idea. If you patent it, you're telling the whole world what, what you're thinking of in detail. You're giving all your ideas in the patent. You have to write everything down for the patent office. So you better decide ahead of time, do I want to tell the whole world what my idea is? You may not want to do that. You may want to keep it a secret. Because if you think that someone's going to steal it, and then you have to sue them, and you don't have enough money to sue them, how do you protect it? If it's a big company, a Toyota, General Motors, steals your idea, you come up with a tool that they could use in a factory, and it's a valuable tool and it saves a lot of money. <coughs> if they steal it, how are you going to fight and take the court, General Motors or Toyota or whoever? That's a very difficult, very expensive thing to do. So you don't. If you have a patent, you can do this, right? If you have a patent. Oh, you, if you have a patent, you can sue them, and you need money to sue them, too. It's, it's a, you, can, you can hire a lawyer and tell him. It's a long and costly thing. To, you can do it. I'm not saying you can't. It, you can do it. It'll take a long time. And, uh, so, in case you uh, win the lawsuit, uh, you will get your money back, uh, isn't it? 
Uh, if you win the lawsuit, there is a depending on how the lawsuit is written up, what you do is you win a certain percentage of the money that was saved by the company who stole it. The, the court will decide. You, you could get millions of dollars, you could get nothing. Uh, I meant the money you have spent uh, on uh, the lawyer. The money, yeah, all that will be recovered. Yeah. Uh, there was a lawsuit by an individual inventor in America. He invented a tool, just a hand tool that you would use in your garage working on a car. He invented that hand tool, and Craftsman, which is a big American tool company, stole the idea, and for 30 years they were making that tool and selling it and making money off of it. And this man was just a normal person, just all alone. And he went to court, I think he went to court in 1968, and he didn't win, the, and this thing went and it was in the courts for 30-something years, and he finally won like $76 million 30 years later, like 1998 or 2000, the man was 72 years old when he won all this money. Can you imagine all that stress for 30 years of his patent was stolen? Now, in his case, he has no choice but to patent it because it's a tool, you can see the tool, so it's easy to steal and it's easy to copy because it's, it's something in front of your face. But if you have an idea on a manufacturing process, like you, you have an idea of how to, like when you're baking, when you're making a, a cake, you have a recipe for making it, a manufacturing process. You may want, not want to patent it because you figure, gee, somebody, to steal this idea, it's going to be very difficult for them to figure out the process and copy it. And it may not make that much money, they may not want to spend all that time to do it. So in that case, you don't get a patent. You get a trade secret, and it's kept secret. Now, the best example of this trade secret is Coca-Cola. Everybody here probably has drank Coca-Cola. I see Coca-Cola machines all over you. All right, there's no patent on the Coca-Cola formula, chemical formula. Coca-Cola keeps that a secret in Atlanta, Georgia, in the Peachtree Center, in the basement of like a 35 or 40 story building with armed guards and the whole thing in a vault. They don't want anybody to know that formula. They keep it a secret. So that's all the trade secrets. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't prevent somebody from figuring out on their own without trying to steal from you. Somebody else may figure out your trade secret because they're just doing it on their own. So it doesn't protect you from that. But what it does do, it is allows you to go to court if somebody's trying to steal from you and you've got your trade secret and you can go to court and, and you, can, you have some, some recourse in court if there is a problem. So it's not perfect. I have a question. Uh, you have to f formalize your trade secret or...? Yeah, the best, the best way to do it is formalize the trade secret and then lock it up. What means formalize this? Decide write a write a long document explaining everything in detail. And okay. then, and then you just keep it. And how it will be separated? It okay. is uh, copied or it is invented idea for someone else. Because that, that, you, you're right. If somebody else on their own, without stealing from you, they're on their own. They figure they figure out the same thing. Then then you could have a there's an issue there. Can you keep the secret when you are a hundred percent sure that this is a, such a thing that nobody else can do? It? That's right. You have to be certain in your own mind that this is going to be an extremely difficult thing for somebody I'm to right. reverse engineer. But there, all of this is there's risk in everything here. There's no guarantee. If you have a trade secret, there's no guarantee that it's safe. If you have a patent, there's no guarantee that it's safe. No, it only allows you to sue, right? You, you, the patent you can sue everybody who needs your patent. Right. However, when you have a patent, you have to write down in detail, which is publicly shared, and you can get on the internet and look up my patent on the internet. You can read everything. So the only protection you have is the ability to sue somebody, assuming you have the money to sue them. Or you can get an attorney to work for free until you win, if you win. Okay. I think we beat that one to death.
Okay, now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on copyright, but you can read here. Copyright is similar to a patent. It's a protection like a patent where if somebody steals it, you can sue them if you have a copyright. Now, once you get a copyright... Copyright is easy. You just put that C in the round and that's it. Right, and then hope nobody steals it because then you got to take it before. All right, so source code, that would be, I mean, I don't think anybody here is planning on writing music or copyright, but source code, that would be of interest here for engineers. Uh, computer files, CDs, computer disks. Okay, now this is important here. It, the copyright protects the, the literal expression. Now, let's say you come up with some fancy wording and you want a copyright, like Nike. Everybody knows Nike, the shoe company? They said, just do it, just right? Do it. Now, I, that's got to be copyrighted. Sure. All right. Yeah. They're only protecting those three words, just do it. They're not, they can't protect the idea behind it. It protects the literal expression, not the ideas and concepts. So if somebody else came up with another way of saying just do it without using those three words, they can copyright it. Right, so so that's, that, that's probably the most important thing of what's on this slide. Is, it's the literal expression for copyright. Uh, let's see. Pri all right, here's the uh, expectations and employee obligations. All right. Any major U.S. company is going to have an expectation from their engineers and scientists that when they're in the laboratory working, that they're documenting the work they're doing. And when, you, when I say documenting, you should have a lab notebook, you should have your name, date, on, on each page. And really, if you want to do it right, you should sign at the bottom of each laboratory page when you're taking your notes. You sign a date at the end of, at the bottom of each page. Because if it ever goes to court later on, five years from now, whatever, and, the, and you're having a battle with somebody who stole your patent, assuming you got it patented later on, if th that document goes to court and everyone will want to see what you did and when you did it. Because when is a big deal. And we'll talk about the timing of things as we go through this. Don't commingle funds. Okay, for us, it's talking about government funding. If, at my company, most of our money comes from the government to build military equipment. At your company, it may not be. At your company, a customer. Some customer comes to your company and says, I want you to build this kind of a machine. And then you design and build that machine, and as you're designing it, you come up with a really great invention for that machine. If the money, if you are being paid directly from the customer to make that machine, and you invented that new invention with their money, then there's an issue of who owns that invention. And that's where commingling means don't mix up the money. If you come up with a great idea, make your company pay for it, so that you can keep your invention in your company because you may be able to use that invention for other products. You don't want to have your customer get the benefit of that invention if you're using their money to come up with the idea. All right, so commingling is a very important concept. You gotta think about that when you're working somewhere. If you come up with a brilliant idea, you better stop before you, if you're using somebody else's money, stop and tell your manager, I got a brilliant idea, you better give me money to pay for this because we don't want the outside company to get the benefit of that idea. All right. Ah, okay. This is starting to get into your question. <laughs> Do not disclose without a proprietary information agreement or other non-disclosure agreement. If you come up with a brilliant idea when you're working on building this, designing this new machine, don't go around telling everybody. As soon as you start telling people, it's a problem. Because for U.S. patent law, and I'm sure Armenian patent law is probably similar, as soon as you start telling everybody, I've got this brilliant idea on how to make this thing, and then you go tell people, especially if you tell people outside your company, then it becomes public knowledge. 
And public knowledge is bad news for you. When something becomes public knowledge, you can't patent it anymore. Just like you can't patent the wheel. Everybody knows about the wheel. So you can't patent that. That's public knowledge. So you can't go around telling people. And if you say, oh, I've written a, a white paper and I want to make a presentation to a, at a technical seminar of my new idea, my invention. You can't do that. If you, if you go to a seminar and you give a public presentation of your brilliant idea before you've sent it to the patent office, you have a big problem. Because the patent office is going to look at it and say, has this been made public before you submitted it to the patent office? And if you tell the truth and say yes, then they go, well, you can't patent it. It's public information now. So you can't do that. And I know that's, the, that's a hard thing because when you invent something, you want to go to a seminar, a symposium. You want to explain what you've done. You can't do that. You, Right, if you write an article and it goes into a journal, that's bad news. Well, that's poison because now it's documented and it's public. So you, you've got to be very careful. When you come up with an idea, the first thing you do is you close your mouth. And you do not tell anybody. All right, you can tell your manager or the people that are very close to you at work, that's allowed because it's within your company. Mm -hmm. and, and you have to do that because while you're working, if you come up with an idea, you have to talk to the people that you're working with. So the people who have a need to know, have you heard that before, need to know? The people that have a need to know, you can tell them within your company, not outside your company. There better not be anybody outside your company that has a need to know that's a problem. But within your company, you're allowed. But don't go around and tell 20 people within your company. So when I was doing my work at my company, I didn't even tell my manager. I said, you know, you don't even have a need to know. But you didn't like hearing that. But, uh, you have to be careful on who you're going to tell. Tell only the minimum number of people. If you want to falter, falter your intellectual property, but already uh, something like that already patterned by the others, do you have a right to make your pattern the same way, or they will not pattern? Right. Uh, yeah, we're going to get into that a little later. I'm gonna, I'll give you the quick answer now, but we will go over it. If you have an idea that, that you come up with an invention, then you get on the internet and you do a patent search, because you want to see if somebody else has a patent. You do a patent search, you find out that somebody has something similar. If, you're, if you can change their idea, here is what somebody else did and here's what you did. If you can make this a little bit different than this, and if it's important, that little bit different is important, then you can get a patent on your idea. And we'll get into that, because I, I have a slide on it. Okay. But that's a good question, and, and it's important. Okay, where are we? Right, we talk about this. this is the thing that... All right. When you're when you come up with your idea and you're working in your company, the first thing you should do is write it down. Don't show anybody and don't talk to anybody about it if you can, other than the people close to you. And then go talk to your manager, or or if, if your company is big enough and you have an invention committee that reviews inventions and decides which one should be patented. Then you write it down and you get the submission to your committee so that they can decide whether this thing should be patented. Okay, that's another good, that's a very good question. And, I, and for some reason I didn't put it in my presentation, but it should have been in there. If you're working for your company, your company designs and manufactures automobiles. And you come up with an idea that has to do, well, this is a true story. All right, well, we won't do the true story. And you come up with an idea that has to do with uh, medical equipment. No, no, I think I'll come this, but this is something. Oh, if it's, if it's in the same area. You cannot do that. You're kind of obligated to tell them if it's in the same area. Now, if it's totally different, you're in automobiles in Europe. Kind of and course. I'm not asking you even this question. All right, but I'm going to give the answer. <laughs> if you're working in automobiles 
and you come up with an idea for medical equipment. Depending on when you went to work for your company, you have to sign a contract with your company. At my company, they own everything. I'm working in automobiles, and if it's a medical equipment, they own it. It doesn't matter. In fact, and, and the, the example that we use is the Barbie dolls. Does everybody know what a Barbie? Everybody know what a Barbie doll is? The girls own. It's a little doll, but it's a beautiful woman. You know how dolls are usually ugly? This one's a beautiful woman with beautiful dresses. And, okay. The man who invented or worked on the Barbie doll was, was an aerospace engineer. So, you know, these are two different technologies. One is toys, and this is for little girls, right? One is toys, and, and he was working in aerospace. But whoever, when you go to work for a company, if you sign a contract that says that they own all of your intellectual property, then no matter what you think of, you're in the shower, you're taking a shower, and you think of something, uh, they own it. Your company owns that idea. If you write it down and submit it to the convention committee, they own the idea. But is it usual practice? <coughs> I don't remember. Well, I, I was working for eight years, but I don't remember. I said, I said, I kind of most people don't know that they sign. If you work in an aerospace in America, you signed it. I guarantee you. All the big companies make you sign it. I mean, the argument, I think that the argument to, from the employer's standpoint is that they've uh, nurtured an environment of, let's say, creativity. They've surrounded you with equipment, with people, with, I don't know, an atmosphere of, of, of such thinking, and therefore they've, you know, they set you up. They contributed to that. Uh, environment where now you are, you know, bearing fruit. I mean, that's not the only argument. I don't know. He's, he's, he's right. right. That's that's what the that's exactly what the, the big companies in America will say. But, I'm but not advocating. I'm just yeah. saying. I think that's where the yeah. argument. No, you're right. You don't mind when they wrestling you be a or something. Yeah, that's right. You're taking a shower and you think of something else. How how could they own it? Well, they own it because you signed the contract. Now, here's here's what you do with it. You write it all down, you submit it to the committee. The committee is not interested in Barbie dolls. An aerospace company, does, they won't even know what to do with it. You have all these PhDs in there. They're going to look at the Barbie doll idea and they're going to go, oh, what are we going to do with this? We can't make money off of Barbie dolls. They don't have enough sense to, to want to sell it to somebody else. They don't want to mess with it. They're not interested. So then, so then what you do is you request a release of your idea from the company. And they got and the company has 30 days to tell you if they want that idea. So within 30 days, if they tell you no, we want that Barbie doll idea, we're gonna do something with it. You know, like sell it to some other company to make money. All right, then they can do that. If it's a, if it's a Barbie doll and you're in an aerospace company, I guarantee you they're not gonna do it. They, 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 don't, they don't have enough sense to to see that this will make money somewhere else. So they won't do it. And then, so then after 30 days, if they don't respond to you, then the law says that, that you're free on your own. I, many of you, or some of you might have been present a couple months ago. We had a seminar. Uh, Ruben Mesjan talked about his experiences working at IBM. And he and some fellow co-workers of his had developed some new database technology. So it wasn't even Barbie dolls and aerospace. It was IBM and databases. And they said they weren't interested in pursuing the idea. So this same example, which is taken in an extreme form here, happens at a, I think, even a much closer form where a company may not be interested. And Ruben and his then co-workers at IBM actually quit IBM when IBM said we're not interested. They basically spun the idea out of IBM, but took it with them. This non-relational database idea that now he is... Yeah, well, he told me this, I don't know. No, no it, that story is true because I've read that in a magazine. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, this happens, I think, in even much, much closer topic areas. If, the, if it doesn't follow a company's strategic direction or if they have a competing product or whatever, they might just not be interested. Anyway, I don't want to... Over here, I do want to tie in. I do want to tie in topics we hear about in our other seminars because they they're mutually supportive. Well, I, I actually have my own personal uh, issue.
So I'm going to tell that. Can I add one thing to the system? Appropriate to this challenge. Swiss companies make watches for over 200 years. A Swiss company employee invented the quartz watch. That's not the next one. Showed it to leadership. Leadership looked at it and said, nah, it doesn't have all these. Moving here is this thing that's not a kind of watch you want to walk. The process ended up with Japanese who got the quartz watch and they took over the business much more sales than regular watches. So there are many examples of both extremes. Right. That, that happened in the late 60s, so that was only about 45 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm sorry, I understand this kind of time, but uh, I was. That uh, the Armenian road law in this one matter is a little bit different. Uh, Armenian law says whatever inventor invents in whichever company, uh, is, it is owned by the inventor. Basta. Except for the cases, except for the cases, if he is doing his direct responsibilities in the company at particular tasks delegated at the moment of the time. Otherwise, in, according to Armenian laws, but well, how worthy Armenian patents are, that's not a question. So, we are the most democratic country in the world, right? Yeah. Okay, anyway. Now, the last one is very important. Acquire your company's permission before presenting in external conferences or publishing technical articles. Remember, if you do publish or present, you lose the right to patent because it's public information. If you go to your company's management and tell them that, gee, I think this should be patented, but I still want to go to and present at the symposium, then you'll work with your people within your company to decide what things should we take out of the presentation so that I can still present it, but it won't affect the patent. You don't want to, take, you don't want to tell them everything at the symposium. If you tell them everything, you're going to lose your ability to patent. So you got to be real careful. This is a very touchy thing. The best thing is don't tell anybody, don't present, don't do any of that until after you've submitted your patents uh, to, the, uh, to the patent office. Okay. okay, why do you want a patent at all? Well, we've done some of this. For the company, it a, it's a, makes your company look good. It's a, something that gives your company a good reputation. It prevents your competitors from using that idea unless they steal it and then you can sue them. Licensing revenues. We haven't talked about that and I want to do that now. If you have a great idea, like the Barbie doll, you work in aerospace and you come up with the Barbie doll and you get your, you get your company to release you. Well, in Armenia, it's already released. But if you're working in another country, you, you request a release. And most companies aren't going to want to make Barbie dolls or sell Barbie dolls. So they release it. So now you have your Barbie doll idea, and you can go get a patent on it. Now you probably, if you're working in aerospace, you probably don't want to make and sell Barbie dolls either, because you're working in aerospace. You're an engineer. So what you do is you go, you go to a toy company, Mattel. In America, Mattel is one of the big toy companies. So you go to Mattel, and you say, I've got this patented idea, and, and if you like this, let's enter into some kind of contractual arrangement and you pay me royalties, some percentage of what they would make in terms of profits off of them making and selling your idea, the Barbie doll, and then you would keep some of that, you would get royalty money from it. You might get 5%, 10%, it's negotiable. Say if they make 100 million in sales and they make 10 million in profit, you might get 5% of the 10 million. So you might get $500,000. And that might be every year, depending on how you write the contract with that company. So the royalties could go for many years. It, could, it might go as, it could go as long as the patent. Now, US, US and European patents are now 20 years long. So you might get a half million dollars a year for 20 years. And then you go do whatever other work you want to do on your own. So that's licensing revenues, and that's typically called royalties. Valuable portfolio. This is more for the company, so we'll, we'll more talk about it. But it, 
that if you come up with, if your company has all these patents and these different products that they make, that's, that has value to your company. Because if your company is going to be sold to another company, having all those patents and all those different technologies that your company is using has great value for your company. Repository of inventive concepts and technology for future use. Let's say you come up with a bunch of ideas that are good for your company, but maybe not useful right now, like, like the relational database. Maybe they didn't want to do it right now. They should have used it in the future. So you want to patent certain things because it may be needed in the near future, so it would be valuable to have it now. Now, for you personally, professional recognition, because you've invented something, you have a patent, some companies give monetary awards for their patents. The monetary awards we got were not very much. It's just a few thousand dollars. And then career advancement. So you may get promoted faster because you did have a patent. But uh, there is not a deal with the inventors, but it gives like 1% or something. Some companies do that and others don't. Uh, IBM, I think, gets a percentage. Uh, Aerospace companies, they just give you a flat rate, two, three, four thousand dollars, that's it. It's not very much. No percentage of No, not aerospace in, in general does not give a percentage, but I think IBM gives a percentage. There are some companies that give a percentage, like kind of like a royalty of, 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 uh, of the money that's made from the patent. Okay, here's the different things that should be patented. System level, design architecture, the actual product, the apparatus, algorithms, software. And the, now this is where my patents are, manufacturing methods or processes. I'm, I'm here. Composition of matter. Now, it's got to be non-obvious. Whatever, again, you can't invent the wheel. It's got to be something that's not obvious to someone who works in your field. Now, after saying that, <laughs> the U.S. Patent Office will tell you we have a very low threshold for non-obvious. So in other words, if you come up with something that you think is non-obvious, they're probably going to let you patent it. So you don't have to worry about it too much. Sometimes it comes up and they say, well, gee, that, that idea is so obvious, you can't patent that. I would suggest you write it down and submit it to your committee anyway. Let, let the lawyers decide whether it's, in, and the business people, decide whether it's something that should be patented. Don't be afraid. Write everything down and just submit it. Don't be afraid. Don't hold back. When you hold back, you may be the one that's making the mistake. But if you write it down and submit it, then you're not making a mistake. Let other people decide whether it should be patented or not. Okay. All right, well, we talked about this. Useful, novel. I mean, you can't invent things that are just stupid and useless. useless. You know, the, the, patent, the, patent, uh, the patent office, they're trained to look at it and they say, is this thing useful to society? If you come up with some stupid idea and it has no use and the patent office decides it's useless, there's no patent. Right. Novel, means it's got to be creative, innovative. Not obvious, this is the one where it's, it's a little... What is not obvious? Yeah, it's, it's up in the air, and then and the patent office will tell you that that's kind of like on a sliding scale, so it's, this is not easily compliant. Okay, now, when you're writing your invention, it must be described in sufficient depth so that a person that's knowledgeable in that field can understand it and know how to do it. Okay? Now, best mode of invention must be described. Now, this one, the law changed in the United States in 2012. Before 2012, you have to tell the patent office the best way to use your idea. Let's say there's five ways of using my new idea. Well, you have to tell the patent office the best way that you think it should be used. All right, now, as of 2012, you don't have to tell them the best way. You just tell them the different ways to use it, and you don't have to tell anybody the best way. First of all, how do you know? How, how could I know which one is the best way? Maybe I don't know either. So I think they finally, it's probably better that you don't have to tell them the best way. If you have patterned your idea, but it has not still come to realize or it has not yet become as uh, matter as you want, 
when someone it realized your idea and it is already uh, came to reality how you can sue the process and say that uh, I want to sue you because you steal my idea but it is uh, just an idea not realized uh, things that you want to uh, make it real okay uh, you can sue hmm? There's no requirement that says that you have to actually have... You can say it is my idea, it is not your idea I have used. I have used my own idea, but you already patterned this idea, and I realized... If you patented it, then it's yours. Then it's yours. So, but it is the, just the theoretical concept, not the realization of the things. The, all right, that, that's the, the realism. And that's a, you make a good point. You, you can have reduction to practice. But it's not a requirement. Reduction to practice, which means realization. In reality, building actual hardware. You are not required to do that to have a patent. Your idea should be buildable, should be buildable, but there's no requirement that you have to build it. Remember, it's intellectual property. It didn't say hardware property. Remember, remember my first, on the first slide, the definition of intellectual property? It's what's in your head, the idea. Now, you can't, you can't invent something that's a perpetual motion machine and then say, okay, this is my idea and nobody can copy it. First of all, how could you make something that's for perpetual motion? But the patent office will look for those kinds of things. If they see something that's perpetual motion or generates huge amounts, of, or you're claiming it generates a huge amount of, of electricity or energy, and there's really no way of making it work, that, that's not going to be patented. Remember, it has to be something useful, no, novel. It's got to be something that can't be made, even though you have it. Yes, I know that everything can be patented, but you are just uh, patenting your idea. Your patent gives you the right to sue somebody, this is the even if they made concept. the hardware. They should pay you... They have to pay you royalties. Because it's I'm not sure that they have to pay you. <laughs> if you sue them... They are free to pattern their own idea and realize what they want to. Well, if, well, if, if you're talking about them having a different idea than what you have, then yeah. But that's, that's two separate patents. But if they're copying your idea, then you can sue them. Now, they may not have any money, so you may not, get any, you may not make any money. All right, so we talked about this already. There's a low threshold for novelty, utility, and non-obviousness. But, but the patent office will still look at it. They'll, they'll filter out the things that are really, that really should be best. Okay, next. Um, I'm going to go through this real fast because this is typically for a big U.S. aerospace type company. But here's the different ways of generating an invention disclosure. One is when the company itself funds the research and development with their own money internally. One is when it's being funded by the outside, by maybe the government or an outside customer is funding it. But then there's an issue of who owns it, if, they, if somebody on the outside funds it. And then if there's contracts where they're, they're giving a contract or specifically to do more. Innovation activity. Sometimes your company will have a competition inside your company to create innovation. And they say, okay, we want people to come up with ideas to do such and such. Bring us your ideas and we'll give out awards. And I've been involved in, in several of these. <coughs> Documentation of dimensions. It establishes a legal record, and we talked about this earlier. Make sure when you have your notebook that you sign and date every page of your notebook. That's important. You say your engineering lab notebooks, evidence, reduction to practice. Reduction to practice is what we talked about, is when you have your idea, and then you actually build something that shows that your idea works. Now, if you can actually build it and show that it works, that, that convinces people that this thing is a really good idea, because you can show them. It's a lot harder when you just write it down on paper and you're trying to convince somebody in your company that they should spend the money to pack it. So reduction to practice is important if you can do it. Now, usually reduction to practice, sometimes it costs millions of dollars to build that first unit. So you don't have the money to do it sometimes. But if it's something easy and you can do it, you should do it. 
Prompt disclosures for the okay, I think this is where I'm going to answer your question. <laughs> Uh, let's see if I can remember the details. If you come in, the law, the U, United States patent law has changed in 2012. So I'm going to try to tell you the before a change and after a change. You have one year from the time that you think of something and then you document it. If you think of something and you never write it down, there's no time limit because how does anybody know if you thought about it? Maybe you were in the shower 10 years ago, you thought of something and you never wrote it down. There's no deadline, there's no time limit, because you never wrote it down. As soon as you write it down, the clock starts. Are you got it? Well, you can have a little bit. Remember, you don't want to go sending your idea of the e on the email to your friends because, because then it starts getting public. And then you got a problem with you can't write it down. You write it down. Now, let's say you're within your company. You write it down and you tell the, your invention committee, you give it to them. So that's kind of like then when it goes to the invention committee, then that, that, that starts the clock. And you got, now this is in the past, a long time. You got 12 months to submit it to the patent office. Yeah, you can now remember who's going to, see the thing is who's going to know. You put it in your safe, who's going to know? I'm saying when it becomes, when you write something down and, it, and it's within your company and other people know, then the clock starts because eventually if you submit it to the U.S. Patent Office, they're going to ask you when did you first document this. Can you trust the U.S. Uh, office when you send your pattern? You said that you should not uh, make it public, but while you are sending your ideas to the that office, how they are guaranteed they will not steal your idea your sending. What's your choice? <laughs> well, that's not a serious thing. What is your choice? I mean, the whole point of this is not some objective, you know, not to send it in email. It's, 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 yeah. it's a legal process. It's like you trust the court system. You trust the. I mean, trust to somebody. You don't have to, but you also. Don't, I, mean, I have my right. own right not trust yeah. their system. Okay. okay, but then how That's do you fine. have them? Then don't have them. How do you sue somebody if you don't trust them? Right, I mean, you don't have to trust anyone. And don't I would say, I would don't say, complain say, later if, you, if someone steals the idea, right? I mean, that's the... Yeah. What is the intention? You can write to yourself because the post office and send it to you and get the stamp. Oh, yeah, you can, you can, you can do all that. Uh, 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 yeah, at least in America, and for my personal, because I've done several of these now, there's not an issue with the U.S. Patent Office. The U.S. Patent Office, as best I can tell, is honest. So, I, so at least for the U.S. Patent Office, that, that's really not an issue. Now, in Armenia, I don't know. <laughs> sends the idea first to the patent office, so you better send a registered mail so that there's a timestamp. When the patent office gets two ideas that are identical, and it could happen, two people at the same time mail into the U.S. Patent Office their invention. And so which, the one that wins the race is, is the one that got time stamped first by the patent office. And this just changed this year. So this is new. Now that one year thing I was talking about, the, the U.S. Patent Office, if they got two that came in, they wouldn't say which one came first, wins. They would ask you, how long ago did you document it? And then you'd have to show them your documentation. And if you had up to that one year before. So that's all changed now. Whoever sends it in first and gets the timestamp, that's the winner. Another another person just not a lot. Well, uh, I have a question in this regard. 
they say there is a patent on something. I don't know about that. And before the time that it was patented, I had been using it in my manufacturing process. The products were ready, but the patenting office did not notice that. Okay, if you were using it before you sent it to the U.S. Patent Office, and before somebody else sent it. Okay, but but when we're saying using it, were you using it internally? If you're using it internally, you're probably safe. But if you're using it in your product and then you sell it and then everybody has it, then you got an issue of whether it's public knowledge or not. I can't give you an exact answer because it depends on the specifics, but if, if, you, if your idea is in a piece of hardware and you're selling it to the general public, then there's an issue there. Because you haven't sent it. You should do that after you send it to the U.S. Patent Office. By the way, the, once it gets to the U.S. Patent Office and they time stamp it, then it's called patent pending, and it's already safe. If somebody steals it, even though they haven't approved it yet, because it takes 32 months, and then you'll find, I have that in a slide. Once they stamp it, it's protected until the time they actually read it. Because they can't, they don't read these overnight. It takes three years before they actually start reading it because they're backlogged, they're behind. But when they stamp it, it's patent pending. If you get a patent later on, then, then it's been protected that whole time. So you don't have to worry about it because you've got the stamp. The, that stamp is a big deal. So, so uh, uh, right after getting the stamp, you can uh, make it public? Yes. After you've got the patent pending stamp, then you can start making it public because it's already protected. Now, it may turn out that the U.S. Patent Office, three years from now, when they actually read it, they're going to go, this isn't patentable. We're not going to let you patent it. Well, then it doesn't matter, right? Because it's not patentable anyway. But uh, the time will uh, sell this stamp uh, that time you have to pay this 40000 or 30000 No, 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 the 40000 are also... Comes later? We finally made it. This is, I mean, we're going over time, so I assume it's okay since you're asking a lot of questions. Is it okay? I mean, yeah, it's all... As long as you're here? It's all okay. Estimation and where we're at? I don't know, it depends on your... I didn't think it was going to take this long, but we've had a lot of interaction, which I like. Probably 20 minutes ago. Okay, I'm going to quickly go through this to give you an idea. Submission of invention disclosure. Okay, I submitted it. And I had an invention, I submitted it. Who did I submit it to? Well, I didn't submit it to my manager because I knew he wouldn't understand it. So I didn't submit it to my manager. Although you, you may typically do that. And then it gets reviewed by somebody before it goes to the committee, usually somebody that understands that technology that we've invented. Then it goes to the committee. The committee's going to decide. Now, when you submit it to the committee, you've got to be like the cheerleader. Does everyone know what a cheerleader is? you got to go in there and say, look, this is really important and it's going to make the company money. I, this is important because you got to give them all the reasons. Don't just hand it to them and walk away. Because they're going to look at it and go, what's this? We don't know if this is important or not. You've got to make sure you tell them. And money, how much, is it going to save the company money? Is it going to make the company more money? Is it going to reduce defects? Is it going to increase, uh, is it going to decrease cycle time? Is it going to improve quality? Does it reduce pollution? In America, reducing pollution is a big deal. You can make a lot of money just on inventions reducing pollution. So those are all things that you got to tell the company that this is what it's good for, right? So, so you got to pitch it hard. Okay, then it comes here, then they decide what to do with it, and you get a chance to make your presentation. And at our company, we got a chance to actually talk to the committee and tell them what it was, good, what the idea was good for. Then they decide. Now, am I? In my personal experience, I submitted 19 ideas. They only liked five of them. That's, a, that's bad. That's a really low percentage. So I, I was striking out. I was losing all the time. And the reason for me was because I had manufacturing process technologies that I was inventing with my colleagues. But the people on the committee were not manufacturing experts. They were 
PhD design engineers, they were, they were analysts. So they didn't have an appreciation for manufacturing technology because that wasn't their expertise. So I, it was very hard for me to convince them that what I was inventing was important because they really didn't understand it and it wasn't something important to them. So that's why my percentage was very low. Five out of 19 is horrible. It should have been more like 10 or 12 out of 19. All right, so they decide, and then they decide. They decide whether it's a trade secret, don't do anything, whether it's throw it away, or, you know, have it be, uh, go to patent. Now, when the patent committee decides they're going to patent something, they don't patent it themselves, they don't write it up. Then what it does is it gets sent to an outside patent attorney office, an outside company that's an expert in patent, an outside attorney office, that specializes in doing patents will be who actually writes the patent. Now, you want to make sure this is, this, is money. This, this, is a, this is a big deal, too. Number one, you want to pick a patent attorney who understands your technology. So if your technology is in chemistry, you do not pick a patent attorney office that has expertise in biology, because they won't know how to write your patent. So you have to pick chemists who understand your chemistry type invention. And so the patent attorney should have a degree in chemistry and be a patent attorney. And then it's better if the patent attorney has a PhD expert in chemistry who acts as a patent agent, and then they, that, the patent attorney uses the patent agent, who's a PhD chemist, as the consultant. Because it's very important when you write, when the, when the patent attorney writes the patent, that that patent is written in a very precise manner so that when the patent office, the U.S. Patent Office reads it, they know that this thing is well written and then they're going to approve it. If you don't have that thing written right, they won't approve it. Or it'll be a weak patent. They may approve it, and it's a weak patent, and then someone else will come along a year later and have a better patent written, and then they will they will actually override your patent. And so your patent kind of becomes useless because somebody wrote a better one. And then it becomes a matter of who wrote it better. So writing the patent is very important you got to pick the right patent attorney who has the technical expertise in your field. Okay? And that's one of the big points I want to make. All right, then they have to decide whether they want to do a foreign filing. So in the United States, we may decide that we want to file a patent in the European Union. We might want to file a patent. Sometimes we file a patent in China, even though China doesn't observe patent law very well. You may want to do it anyway because in 10 years from now, China may change, and China may be better at protecting your patent. So you have to decide where. And, and your patent, uh, the people within your company, your management will ask you, your patent attorney will ask you, where do you think this should be patented? And so you better know where you think it should be patented. For us in America, it's usually South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, because they're strong electronics. European Union, the U.S., that, those are the main ones. Okay, next. All right, we already talked about this prior art. When you come up with your idea, you get on the internet, you start looking for who else has done what I thought of. If I thought of something, I want to see if somebody has done that before me. Then you got to make sure that when you write your patent, that you're not copying somebody else, because that's important. Then you're cheating. So that's called prior art. What was done in the past that's on the internet that I can look at, and you can look at um, patents, U.S. patents are on the internet from 1976 until now. So you can look at the last 30, 40 years worth of patents. All right, so I just talked about that. Now, even if you find prior art that's close, mm -hmm. submit your idea anyway, maybe you change it a little bit, then it can be patented. All right, this just tells you how to do the keyword searches. U.S. Patent Trademark and Office. Okay, next. What, what number are we on? Well, we're, we're done at, I think, 23. Okay. Uh,
All right, now talking about costs of the patent office, there's about 30,000 for the patent attorneys. And then every three years, you have to send a fee to the U.S. Patent Office to maintain your patent. It's a maintenance fee. And I don't know, I think that's $500 or $1,000 or something. Is it your keeping possible to a normal scientist or an engineer to do himself or herself? You could do your own patent yourself. There's nothing preventing you from doing it. But because there's a very specific way of writing it to, to maximize the protection for your patent, I would recommend that you don't do it because it'll take you far longer to learn how to write it than if you just went out and paid somebody else to do it. And if you make a mistake, then you've lost everything. And I think he's asking about, he's asking about uh, how you can by yourself a pet. No, you relation of the you, 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 you cannot do. This is hopeless thing. It's very difficult to do the, 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 the only thing that you can the easiest thing for you to do is write a very detailed white paper. I was going to talk about that on a later slide. You write a very detailed white paper and then you submit that to the patent attorney and then you work with them because you just can't give it to them and walk away. You're going to have to help them understand it. You're going to have to help them. Work. Then they have to write it for the U.S. Patent Office, which is a very specific way of writing it. But the attorney is going to ask you a thousand questions. Back and forth, back and forth. My first patent took seven months. Back and forth. I went back and forth, I think, 11 times. From the attorney to me and my colleague. And back. It's doing this. And then finally it was done and we sent it. All right, here's another issue. Sometimes you, your company may not want to do a patent because you can't police it. And what that means is, if I have a medicine, some of mine are manufacturing, well, almost all of my inventions were manufacturing processes. How are you going to know if some company in China copied your manufacturing process? There's no way. I, I'm not in their factory. I don't even know where the factory is. And, it, and when they sell the product, you can't tell from looking at the computer, say, that they copied my manufacturing process. So in that case, you don't want to get a patent because it's impossible to know if they even stole it. So what you do is, that's when you trade secret it. You get a trade secret. You just write it down and you put it in your safe and you keep it trade secret. So that's another reason for having trade secret. And then you don't have to spend any money with the attorneys. You don't have to get a patent. You don't have to worry about everybody knowing about it. Remember, when you get a patent, it's, it's public information. It's on the internet. <clears throat> okay, now this is important. When it says no file, when the committee says we're not going to file for a patent, don't take that as an insult. Sometimes it's better to do the trade secret because of the police issue. Sometimes this is the smartest thing to do. So just because you don't get a patent does not mean that your idea was bad. It might mean that this is a better way to protect it. Remember? So, you know, trade secret, actually in our company, a trade secret, we got the, if we got a patent or a trade secret, the company paid us the same amount of money. Not very much, but it was the same. So from a monetary point of view, they considered them equal. All right, we're going to go through this fast. This is the 12 month, <coughs> within 12 months of patent rights loss. Now see, this has changed. This, this is actually old. Uh, this is kind of, this is telling you how long things take, usually. Usually. There's, this is good. None of this is in concrete. And it's also showing, uh, let's see. <coughs> This is for foreign patents. See, the foreign patent filing is a little bit different here. Present idea to the committee, draft application without, with outside counsel, three to six months. See, that's that 12, year, 12 months we were talking about before it goes to the patent office. Well, write disclosure. See, as short as possible as the time period, because they, in other words, in, before the law changed, they wanted you to write it down and then submit it to the committee and then get it over to the patent office within 12 months. But really, they want it as soon as possible. They don't want you wasting time. Now they're saying, we don't care. Whenever it gets to the patent office, we date stamp it. And whoever got in first, they win. 
But still, this gives you an idea of how long things take. Okay, now, the U.S. Patent Office date stamps your patent when you send it to them, your invention, not your patent. It's not approved yet. They have to read it and go through it, and that takes months for the... They don't even look at it for the average time that they have to... You have to wait is 32 months after it's date stamped before they even start looking at it because they're backlogged. They're so far behind in patents to read and to approve. They're 32 months behind. So it takes a long time. But this is when the patent pending protects you. This is the line. Anything after that, regardless of when they actually read your patent and approve it, the line starts when they get stamped it. That's when the, the time starts. And then you get 20 years before your patent expires. Okay. Oh, we talked about all this pretty much. Yeah, let's go to the next one. Well, we talked about this. How can a company make money off of your patent? Well, we talked about it. They can license or sale of patents for royalties. We talked about that. You can, you can actually license trade secrets if you want. <coughs> Data rights. Here's ways of making money. Licensing royalty money. Can I license trade secrets? I don't understand this. You have the secret. Okay. And you want, and if some other company says, do you, do you know how to do this? You reveal the secret then to them? But yeah, but with, with contracts and attorneys involved, yeah, you reveal the secret to them. But they're paying you for it. it's gone. No, it's well, they're paying you for it. You're just sell. The secret is secret. gone, then you, uh, how is it shared? Yeah, you share the secret. It's still a secret. You share it. Okay, so the, the guy who you are uh, licensing, who is licensing the secret, is not, has no rights to sell to somebody else. Well, that's all in your contract with them. If you decide that you that if they say we want to sell it to somebody else and you agree to it, then that's all part of your contract. You, you know, the contract is up to you and the other company. But if he, he sells the if he sells the secret without telling you. Yeah, well, that, that, well, I can't that's, prove that. Well, that. well, that would be hard to prove if it was a manufacturing process. You have to trust the company that you're dealing with. A lot of it is just trust, right? Well, licensing the secret, I, I see this first time. I didn't know that. The licensing the patent, I know. You pay the. You can license the trade secret. It, it's, it's, it's licensing simple. the patent is very understandable. So you license the patent, but you don't pay fee. But how do you license the secret? The secret is done if you get the secret. Well, they, they, they can keep the secret, or you, you agree that they're going to expose the secret. As long as you agree to it, they can do whatever they want. Okay, then you, then you sell the secret, the secret. I see. You okay. share it. It's all in how the contract is written. I see. Okay, okay. okay go ahead. Okay, I'm, this is just a review. You document your inventions. We talked about writing your name on each page. Do not try to, uh, to determine if the idea is patentable. Let your management and your, and your own company attorney decide that. You're not the one that's going to decide whether it's patentable or trade secret. Let the attorney decide that. I mean, you're going to be involved, but you're not going to do it alone. Uh, talk about it. Okay, next. Okay, now we've already gone through this again. We already went through it once. So now I'm going to talk about, real quick, or I'm going to talk about in two minutes my own personal experience. Go ahead. All right, I already told you I had 19 invention disclosures submitted. 80% of them were manufacturing technology. Here's what they were doing. How do you make hardware better, faster, cheaper, or greener? Less, less pollution. Most committee members are PhDs and have little or no manufacturing. This is a big problem for me and for the types of submissions that I have. Only five of 19 of, of mine were approved for patent. So right now I have one U.S. patent and one European Union patent and three U.S. patents are now pending. I'm just waiting. I mean, it'll be two or three more years. And they're 32 months behind on patent submissions at the U.S. Patent Office. Okay, next. And this is the last one. All right. Here's, here's what you as an engineer have to do. You've got to write a very detailed white paper describing your invention. You've got to do a really good job of describing it. I would suggest you write a white paper, 
then you create a slight presentation because you're going to have to present it to your management and to your attorneys at your company. If you have reduction to practice, did you come up with a prototype of your idea? So if your idea is a, is a machine, did you build that machine? Does it work? So that would be good. If you can do that, this is a huge advantage to proving to people that your idea is really good. Reduction to practice is very important if you can do it. And then we talk about it. You hire an attorney that has expertise in the field of your invention. Don't hire an attorney who handles criminals. They're not going to know how to write a patent. So you've got to be careful here. We talked about this, having a PhD in the field, because we were working with an attorney on this chemical invention. The patent attorney was a chemist with a four-year chemist, chemistry degree, and then that patent attorney used a patent agent who had a PhD in chemistry. So for, for one of my patents, there was a lot of expertise at the, at the patent attorney office. Now, you always have to work closely with the patent attorney because there's always going to be a misunderstanding as to what it is you wrote. So you've got to work closely with them. And after the patent is written, after, you, after they've written your patent and you think you're all done, you're not. The hardest part, you haven't even done yet. The hardest part is anticipating, is somebody going to look at my patent that I've written, make it slightly different, and then they're going to patent that slightly different part and kind of ruin your patent. So you have to figure out how many layers around my patent do I have to think about and write into the patent to protect my patent. And that's called a multi-tiered multi or multi-layered patent. And that's the part where you really need a patent attorney because they will ask you a thousand questions about how do we put these other layers around this basic patent so that somebody can't change it a little bit and then they get a patent. And that's called the onion. You know, you got a soap, peeling the onion. You've got all these different layers of the onion. That's what you have to do with your patent. And I'm telling you, that's the hardest part. Because I invented this. I, I don't know about all these other things out here. I didn't invent something over here. I invented this. How am I going to know all these other things? So you spend more time trying to figure out, well, if somebody wrote something here for my patent, how am I going to, I have to figure that out so we write it into this patent. I have to, like, predict the future. And that's hard. That's what takes so long. So even after, after you've written this, you've only started. This is the basic part of your patent. You have layers of additional protection, the onion layers. Okay, and I think that's okay. discussion we might have gone over a time a little bit. Uh, I will take a couple of questions now and then as long as uh, Mr. Yeah. Knarr can stay here and as long as this room is not needed, uh, you know, we can hang around and, and uh, informally continue. Uh, but maybe we'll take a couple of questions and then and then if people have to run they can run. I want to wait for the students to ask questions. Yeah. No questions? Alright, one thing that when you're trying to sell your idea to your company so that they'll want to patent it, you're going to have to have like a 20 to 1 ratio on uh, money that you're going to make off your patent versus how much it's going to cost to get the patent. So if, they, if it costs 40000 the typical U.S. patent costs $40,000 to get with the attorney costs and all that, you better have an idea that's going to make your company at least Eight hundred thousand dollars, twenty to one. Because other than that, it's not worth it. It's too much. It takes too much time from different people. They want a big payback, big, big profit. If you if you're going to spend forty thousand dollars and you're only going to make your company sixty thousand dollars, your company's going to say, forget it. We're not interested. That, that's it's just too much effort. So you got to do that math. You got to do that financial analysis, economic analysis, while you're writing up your idea to prove to them that it's worth spending the time and effort and money to get the patent. It's got to have a huge payback. And I'm giving you as a rule of thumb, 
20 to 1. At our company, it was minimum 10 to 1. 10 to 1, they wouldn't even pay attention. At 20 to 1, 30 to 1, 50 to 1, then you get their attention. Okay? This is the professionals who are good at studying the onion real idea that you mentioned at the end. It would be a good idea to expand that discussion longer because today those patterns who are poor become vulnerable for professional thieves to take it and read it. It's a really good idea to expand that. Okay. It, it, it is a big problem for, for a person who's writing a patent to try to predict who's going to try to copy my patent and change it a little bit over here, over here, over here. And you have to be able to write all those things into your patent so that they can't do it. Okay. You heard about companies, that's clear. Let's say we are at American University here. Right. We are professor, this professor. So I come up with some good ideas. And then right. I think I think this is a good thing to pay. Why I am thinking? Because, uh, well, I know the history of cryptography, for example. Right. Uh, two professors from Stanford University in 1976, they publish a paper and they get, they get, they get uh, it was a revolution at that time. And 20 years they're getting like, money for, from the patents. So it was uh, really billions of dollars, billions of dollars. But that was the idea. Let's say I think this is something similar idea. Okay, how I can do this? So how about I can uh, through this the management of our university, for example, get to fight for the patent? How can I can I do that? It's forty thousand dollars if upfront spending, right? Forty thousand dollars. Well, if, if you how want, I can if you want a US patent and that's really where you're gonna make money. Yeah. <coughs> you're gonna spend Big money comes from the U.S. Right. Course. You're going to spend at least forty thousand. You may spend well, I want more. also Japanese. I want also uh, European Union or something. So no, you'll spend a hundred thousand dollars. You'll spend over a hundred thousand dollars. Okay. Now, how can how can I convince the management of university, for example? That, that's going to be a, that'll be a very difficult thing to do. You, you I was I was thinking I published the paper, get the recognition. Well, this is the best paper, and I have one year to to, to do that. No, if you publish yeah, this, this is hopeless thing, then how can I phone these people? If you that? publish that paper yes. before you have sent your patent idea to the patent office, then That's you cannot get it. Okay, then how uh, this, okay, this is $100,000 spending. How can I uh, okay, convince my university in management that this is good to do? Is there a chance for that? I'd say the chance is pretty low because I worked for a major corporation that had a lot of money, and I only got five out of nineteen. See? Is this be, uh, well, how about the is there good news here? Yeah, I do have good news. Yeah, I think there's good news. You got a couple of ways. Up. Number one, you, you, you're not going to go to the AUA management team here because okay. they probably don't have the money. Okay. And, and they're going to say, look. You're a crypt cryptographer yeah. expert. Yeah. This is a university, so okay. we're not we're not experts in. Okay, I go to Samsung. For example. So you got to go to either an outside company. Okay, I go to outside company. Or Samsung. hang on, you got to go to an outside company, or you have to go to a wealthy individual that you trust. Oh, and, and have them handle yeah, yeah. it. Okay. Awesome. You can. Yeah, well, I, I trust you, but how do you trust me? But you have to have, well, I told you, you got to write everything down in detail, and then you create your slide presentation, and then if you can build a reduction to practice, that's how you're going to try to convince somebody. I didn't say it was easy. But, but you know, also, isn't it good news if, if you work for a company or if you work for a university who's not interested in, what are they not going to be interested in? They're not interested in defending the patent, right? It's no well, use to patent something if you're not going to be prepared to fight it, correct? Right, right. Okay. Now, if they're not prepared, they might sign a waiver saying, okay, it's yours. Okay, it's yours. Then now, do with but yours. that's the first step. This question is, after he gets past the university. Yeah, but now you have, how but does that, that wasn't under? your question. You okay, said, I, how do you get it? The university says you are you are free to do it. Yeah, but maybe it's yours now. And now, step two is everything that I think Randall just said. You find a partner who's going to mutually benefit. It's going to make billions, or even more, I hope, for you. 
Uh, in your example, then, then they, there should be partners out there who are prepared to split billions with you. The but you have partner. Yeah. See, in cryptography, for example, until you get uh, recognition for the, from the community, then you can do something. You cannot say, oh, I keep it secret. Well, you can. can. But if it's you're going yeah. yeah. to go to a symposium, if you're going to go to a symposium and present, you can't tell them the real heart of your idea. You don't, that you don't tell them that this, this is what we are talking about. You don't tell them right here. They say, what is that? This is not that easy. I, I know it's not easy. <laughs> I never, I never get, uh, you see, I, get, I have 10 patents actually, but I never was involved in these stories because I work for the company, they find the patents. But I'm just thinking, what, what if I have some good idea and what's going to do something? It's, look, it's very difficult. I, I showed you, I work for a big company and I only got 5 out of 19. It's a low, for me it was a low probability. Of those. No, you, can, you, can, you can sign everything with the company, but then how company can do it? If they don't understand what they, they can say, what is that? How I know this is a good thing or not? No, they don't might understand it really well and still say huh? that. Huh? I mean, it's not just their ignorance. I think IBM is pretty good with databases. I mean, but in our example here two months ago, no, so they, they, no, why are you surprised? They, maybe it was a strategically different direction. Maybe it is a failed idea. Maybe they have a competing product. Maybe they see the technology evolving in a different direction. I mean, it's, a, it's not black and white. I mean, I think there's a million reasons why they may not, you know. You have to sell the good idea. You have to be a little bit If you just wrote it down <coughs> and give it to somebody who did not appreciate it, Badness. It's your fault it's not going doing the marketing job to say what's the market value, something like that. The example was the watch, the Swiss company, quite watch. The engineer was a simple engineer, was not a marketing person. He did not really show the market value outside the company. And so he was. So maybe you want to get some trusted people who do value. You get an evaluation with the VA say it's a million bucks outside. If you go to a society, they'll buy that from you for so much money. And then as a marketing potential, you create market value for something you have in the pocket for Do you have a contact at Stanford that you said you have a contact now where you can reach them and you can trust them, show them your work, and then if you can get them interested, because they're at Stanford University, by the way, you can so rich, so he was retired. When he was 50 years, he retired. He said, I don't need any, any professorship. Can you imagine that? He retired from professorship at Stanford University. Because he said he was driving a plane. Martin help him. All right. If you have contacts like that, you should get a hold of those types of people and share with them your idea, assuming you trust them. Okay. Or you get a legal document where you sign yeah, it. You have kind of the, okay, so you have to share. You private. 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 Not public. I would suggest that you get a non-disclosure agreement signed with you. Okay. We're, we're done unless you have more questions. Come down here and ask more questions.